<laughs> Sorry. So, well, uh, no, so um, I will restart. So, first of all, I want to thank SB and uh, Wolf Gunter for inviting me to this like just amazing uh, event, experience, uh, very inspirational talks, very nice hosts, and so on. So, well, uh, when I was 18, I think I could then, if I look back, could call myself a naive scientist and a naive artist. Making nice pictures, uh, looking at science as something that will save us all. Uh, if I see myself now uh, as a as a former scientist, <laughs> um, I would be like a concerned scientist, but most of all um, a philosophical activist and a hyper-reflexive artist. These are the titles I also use in my social media. Philosophical activism for me is. Uh, organizing discussions on concepts that are important for us, things like uh, sustainability or equality, in contexts where most of the times they are often forgotten or ignored, mostly political contexts. So when you bring them there and you organize discussions around these concepts, then you are a philosophical activist. Because you have to talk about the theory, but of course with the final aim to see what it can mean for application in reality. And uh, I do that on, in many ways. Um, so for instance, as a lecturer on science and technology, ethics of science and technology, teaching engineers and scientists that the things are much more complex than they have been taught at uh, school. Uh, that science has to deal with uncertainties, uh, that uh, science has to deal with value-based uh, judgments, um, that it, there, is no, um, that there is no tension between emo and ratio, that scientists also can be emotional in the way they believe specific things. And um, just give you one example, um, if I tell my students that uh, the, the weed killer roundup hmm, from Monsanto, if uh, an expert from Monsanto says uh, it's safe when you use it as prescribed, and an expert from the World Health Organization tells you that it's possibly causing cancer, which they do, that the general public will think that one of the two is lying. Okay, most people will think the guy from Monsanto is lying because he's paying lip service to the company. But the, the, the truth is that none of the two knows for sure. Both being good scientists, really good scientists, they can put forward their preferred hypothesis on what is actually the case. And it's for everyone very difficult to understand that two scientists doing research can come to different or even opposing conclusions based on the same incomplete data. This is something that needs to be really highlighted, not only in schools, but also in politics. And we have seen the COVID case as one of the most important and the most thankful cases really to be used in education of these things. Never before science has been so much under pressure to deliver evidence it could not deliver yet in politics and for the market. Uh, but my other work on philosophical activism is my new humanism project. And there I take things in a more general way. And I, I really believe, and I refer to your introduction, um, what are the problems we're facing um, what is holding us to really uh, make things better for the future. I really believe that we are still stuck in systems we inherited from uh, modernity. Systems that were really helping us moving forward at that time. Uh, I see modernity as an emancipation process. Uh, we've developed modern democracy. Um, We've developed modern, modern science, we've developed uh, modern market systems, we've developed uh, modern education systems, also with the, the idea that every child should uh, enjoy education and so on. So these are emancipatory processes away from the truth of the, of the emperor and priest. And they worked at that time, but now they're holding us to really move forward. For democracy, for instance, um, we should get rid of political parties. Uh, they are really um, they are polarizing discussions instead of moving things forward. 
Um, one interesting uh, topic, for instance, is nuclear energy. I always say back in time it was simple. The socialists were against in Belgium and the liberals were in favor. Now I personally know socialists who are in favor because of climate change, liberals who are against because of Fukushima. But party politics works this way that you have to come up with one point of view, so you create polarization instead of conciliation. The other big problem in politics I see is the nation state. Nation, nation states have never emerged or shaped for cooperation. They came into being to defend and themselves against each other. So they were never meant to cooperate, and now we need them to cooperate on climate change, for instance. And state sovereignty will always be the prime interest of every nation state, which means that we have slow, we have progress, but slow progress in this kind of agreement. So voila, we need better, better methods. I won't really lecture too much about that because it would be a bit boring. The whole, the whole idea of participation, deliberative democracy, uh, transdisciplinarity in science is the way to go. But of course, if you want to reform systems, then you need the people who like to operate in the old systems, the politicians. But there is no reason for pessimism. Um, I had this discussion with Tinkerbell, with Katinka and you also on the first day. Uh, I am an optimist. I have no choice. Otherwise, I cannot do this work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe in the power of people, in creativity. Um, we can paint dystopian pictures. When, uh, when I saw the war in Ukraine breaking out and Putin, Putin um, talking about using nuclear weapons, I was, as in, an informed human being, much more scared than the normal population was at that time. It's, I mean, the danger is still not over. But um, we have come to times where the previously unimaginable happens. 30 years ago, when you'd say the tourists would fly with a plane into skyscrapers, you would say, wow, well, that will never happen. And it happened. They can fly with a big plane into a nuclear power plant, and it will once happen. But you have to remain optimistic in that sense. So new humanism, why new humanism? What's wrong with the old one? Uh, the old one is exactly what I just described. The self-confidence of the human being, I mean in the Renaissance, so suddenly realizing that we can find out for ourselves what is true and valuable, we don't need the emperor and the priest for that, made us too self-confident. Uh, we now say that science will uh, develop uh, all solutions and everything else, art, spirituality, is just in the way and it making things more complicated, of course, and that's not true. Mm. Yesterday, uh, Dana and I, in our long walk, we talked about, for instance, the, um, the, um, the answer about the origin of the universe. I studied cosmology at university, but I really believe that we as human beings we will never find a scientific answer about the origin of the universe. Because we're going to like bump into observation horizons all the time. So religion claims it has an answer. Scientists try to find an answer too. And many of them really believe in their formulas and say this is the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I say that none of the two sides will ever find the real answer. But we don't need it. This is new humanism. We don't need the answer to make this world a better place for all. So you put science into context and you put religion into context compassionately, critically, but compassionately. And so this uh, project, New Humanism project, is online. The, um, the tagline is um, Liberating Thoughts for Reflexive Minds. You can read it in two ways. It's, um, you, you can uh, free, set free thinking um, for the better of society. But the thoughts themselves can liberate, can uh, create freedom. And uh, this, this uh, sign is coming back all the time in everything I do, not only in the philosophy, but also in the art. It's a simple, it's a simple, uh, it was a paper uh, where you can record a signal 
with a measurement uh, an instrument. And I scanned it and I flipped it. And for me, it's like a sign. It looks like very scientific, but it's meaningless. It's a sign for reflexivity. Voila. Um, the philosophy, but then, um, to make the story short, um, there is this art project that develops in parallel to it. And I look at myself critically from out of my art. Because um, also philosophical activists don't have the truth, but they can create dialogue around concepts. And um, my life work as an artist, I, I always say when I die, I will have only made one work. Uh, that is the suggestion of a non-existing hypothetical research institute. And it's called the, the Institute for Allocuosity, of Allocuosity for Elements of Seduction. This is the floor plan. This has been de this under full development, but very rarely now new departments are created. It, it's, it's, it came into shape. I don't want to bother you with like going into the whole explanation of the departments, but basically there is a social side and a political side. And um, you could say, I mean, talking about referring to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, this the Institute is researching a new social contract mm -hmm. that should be different for the social side as for the political side. Very briefly, in the social side, we have to learn while accepting ambiguity. Uh, for the political side, we have to create systems that create clarity and compassionate confrontation. Simply said, on the social side, when somebody Say, says to you, I love you, that you're not allowed to ask, what do you mean? <laughs> when an expert on the political side says the situation is safe, then he's obliged, he or she, to explain what he or she means with that. But these are simple examples. And also, I mean, and in the art side is the black version of the reflexivity, it comes back in everything. It's my, on my screensaver, it's on my phone, and so on. And uh, it's not, I don't stick to it for some reason. It just became part of myself, so to speak. And in, the, uh, in this art project, um, um, I once was able to buy the official web domain, the artsinstitute.org. These are not available anymore, all these official web domains. Uh, companies buy them, and you can buy them from them for a higher price. But this one, say, 15 years ago, escaped of the out of the attention of these companies. So I could buy the artsinstitute.org. And if you Google the Arts Institute, you either first come on my website, and secondly, the famous Arts Institute of Chicago University, or the other way around. So, and, uh, and I use it for my own art activities. People may believe it's an existing institute. And then you play with these things. It does exist because it, there's a physical place people can come to to watch shows. But in the same sense, it doesn't exist. And, and, and I really annoyed also the art world in Antwerp with this uh, because I applied to be part of the, uh, the, the group of galleries that organizes Nocturnus. And they really had discussions about me, about whether I should be allowed in the network or not. And in the end, I'm allowed. But the, the, the bigger Antwerp art weekend, I've been kicked out twice already. Because now you're not a real institute. And this is, of course, what I want, this kind of reflective discussions around it. And uh, I also make films. I'm going to stop with that and also show that work. I, mean, I think melancholy. Uh, is needs revision. I mean, the meaning of melancholy needs. I, f I find melancholy the highest intellectual state of mind a human being can reach. It's beyond the social versus the political. It transcends it, and you realize and accept the impossibility of pure beauty, pure perfection, and so on. And you realize and understand this is the world as it is. And uh, this is a film still. 
uh, from my, my, my films are always very simple, hands-on, no special effects, no, no complex decors, it's what you see is what you get. Sometimes uh, when, uh, when I need actors in a, labo, in a laboratory, then I project a photo of the laboratory on the screen and I put them in front and everybody can see it's just projected on the screen. This photo, taking away this person, is an existing photo from the Collective Actions Group, this um, the Moscow based uh, actions group, artistic group. A few of the members still exist. Um, and uh, I added this. This is my ex girlfriend who was under a blanket in a garden. And I added her to this photo. And suddenly it became something very meaningful in the movie. I mean, you have to see the movie, it's, it's a short movie, they're on the website, to understand what it is. But um, it's always, um, the, the images you see almost that are not real, I appropriate art and, uh, and uh, transform it uh, to, to create feelings of melancholy, but that are consolating. Uh, Today, I mean, especially in English, melancholy means depression. It's literally translated as depression, which is, of course, not the case at all. Mm. It's, as I said, it's a very complex mood. It's, a, it's an intellectual state of being, melancholy. We can go back to the 19th century um, interpretations a little bit uh, on that. Uh, but we have to revive it and, uh, and create its new meaning in that sense. And then uh, another thing, a special technique I use, um, I'm obsessed with large dams, water dams. For me they are, um, in a way, uh, they, they represent a lot of things. They're silent, the dams are silent, uh, they are integrated in nature. It's a very complex uh, human-made structure, and it's, it looks very peaceful and it's an, a hidden power. But at the same time, of course, it can have devastating effects on nature as such. I mean, forced resettlements of villages in, and so on. So it's a very complex thing in such. And I um, also here for this kind of works. My inspiration is modernity. These are simple photos I scanned and I printed on MDF. Uh, um, it's a very simple technique, everybody can do it. You take these plastic transparencies we used to, to do presentations before we had LCD projectors. And, uh, and a desk jet printer, commercial <coughs> desk printer, and I print them on the wrong side, so they remain humid. And when you push them then on, the, on this uh, uh, plate, then the ink sucks in. They're always unique pieces, because uh, if when you do it a second time, it will be a little bit different. And, uh, and for me, this, this technique also, the picture presents itself in front of uh, the, the underground. At the same time, you cannot grasp it. It really sinks away into the, um, into the, uh, the underground also. And you cannot print white. It's, not, it's impossible to print white, so every highlight, which, is, which looks more bright than the surrounding, is actually simply no ink. And uh, I really work with this um, since a long time. I also make bigger ones uh, in color, full color. And uh, then, of course, I'm always limited to the size of A4. So I really, in, in, like in six to three pieces, I have to really stick them next to each other and so on. So, voila. And the last thing I want to say is to something I want to couple back to the previous discussions, uh, the work with children. I don't work with children. I'm not saying I don't want to do that. But my main focus in my new humanism project is about a good general care for children. And uh, it's about reform of education. We need, we need to reform education of our children and adolescents. Uh, today we are, and we, this is also something I said in the discussion in uh, Stendhal, um, we are educating our, our kids to remain stupid and to function in society, as, as we said. Yeah? So, the simple question, what kind of education would we need?
to really enable our children to become, to become, to develop themselves as self-critical cosmopolitans, world citizens. This simple question can already raise concern and even irritation in the political world. Also in Belgium, we have, for instance, religious-inspired indication uh, that uh, I mean, Catholic or Islam or what, and and I say we we should get rid of it. We should integrate education, uh, religion as a topic in education, in reflective education. And even that is already politically very difficult in Belgium, let's stand in other countries uh, like the US or Afghanistan and so on. It's not only about religion, it's also about science. So, and um, it could be called naive, I'm, I'm doing salons on that, so the, um, the, the, the called um, education for cosmopolitanism beyond comfort zones. And uh, simply putting this question on the table, uh, what kind of education would be neat to really help our children to develop as self-critical world citizens? And do we need it? But I would turn the question around. Is everyone uh, skeptic would need to answer the question, why don't, why shouldn't we need it? this kind of education, and then it's their turn to answer, and we always fail in that sense. And this, with, this, uh, with this question, I'm organizing salons. I did the first kickoff one in New York in 2019, uh, with people from the UN, and then, then Corona broke out, and then it stopped, and I'm relaunching it since this year. Yeah, Great, thanks. Uh, as always, yeah, guess on gives us a lot to think about, and uh, uh, I appreciate that he has a great clarity. Uh, it goes down all, also to his diagrams. And, um, you know, I'm writing down key, key things you're saying, but uh, what the big theme that I'm drawing from it, and knowing you for years, I've known for 10 years, we met through radiation uh, protection related conferences in Europe. And, uh, you know, oh, he's an artist, I'm an artist. You know, we became friends. and. Uh, but the big word that comes out is the need for revision, revision. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I agree, uh, and I guess the question is always how. Uh, we can answer, I feel maybe your thinking is very directed into what could be the end destinations or, or, or the process uh, that we want. Uh, but then again, how to implement it is always going to be a question. Of course, you can establish an institution, and that's, that's always very helpful. Um, and um, in that, yes, emancipation as, as a key um, concept, the need for that. Um, the importance of grasping uncertainty, what it means for our decision making. Again, as only partly evolved human beings, we're not quite there, humans really are bad at making decisions with uncertainty. Uh, so, um, and dialogue was another one. You talk about governance and that, and, and specifically uh, uh, pointing out the problems with political parties and nation states, which is interesting because recently I've been reading about, you know, other, other you know, both historical examples and also things happening now, other <laughs> kinds of governance where the city state Mm -hmm. comes out as a fantastic model yeah, yeah. and one thing that is pointed out is that we have many cities like with a thousand year history or 500 year history uh, but nations last about 300 years you know so cities are much more enduring uh, groups of humans even though luck can change in them so that is very interesting um, but um, you end up saying that you you are optimist because you have no other choice. Is that what one, you said? Yes, but, but and one of the the reasons is okay. This this all sounds like very utopian. I mean, like we need to reform of the systems, mm -hmm. uh, uh, international politics, uh, science, and so on. And at the same time, um, thinking about it is meaningful because I think it's not done enough. Um, Look at the look at the uh, U.S. elections. Even a critical voice, media voice, as the New York Times, will never ever say, "Guys, what are we doing here? What are we doing? What, what, why do we get lost 
Why do we lose ourselves in this like a hypocrite, crazy competition between two individuals? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with the system? Nobody is saying that. They all comment pages and pages on what Harris said and what, and, and what Trump said and what this person did and so on while taking a step back and say, okay, okay, this thing goes on and it needs to go on because I have no other choice, but let us at the same time think about how we can get rid of this kind of crazy system. So, but what I said, I'm also an optimist because um, rethinking systems can always go together with real life, bottom up, local activities mm -hmm. like we do here, like you do with the children. They are so necessary and they will grasp into each other. Um, what you do can be a life changer for one of these kids. Mm -hmm. They will never forget it anymore. And they're, they're without um, being stopped, they can go on a different path in their life because they got this experience. Mm -hmm. and, this, uh, and you can even rethink systems with, with kids. I'm um, talking about politics, not to brainwash them, of course, but to really raise questions they have no all my intellectual leftist friends I meet in the bar in Antwerp and I, I, I call them like that, not with irony but with much love because I would also call myself a leftist intellectual. I ask them, why do you never rethink politics? We are all commenting on the way politics is done. And then I say, well, I don't know, I mean it's probably the best system we can have. Say no. no and then, but it's, it's so strange that even my leftist intellectual friends almost attack me and call me naive if I think of reform of politics. Mm -hmm. like, and that's a big problem. If, if the people who should think with us mm -hmm. don't think it's a relevant yeah. thing to do, yeah. then it is a problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, there's lots of counterexamples happening all over the world, historical examples of other ways of having participatory decision-making, we'll call it democracy perhaps, mm -hmm. that are in some ways more inclusive or fairer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we know there are lots of options. We don't just have, you know, uh, communism, socialism versus, you know, liberal democracy, uh, where authoritarianism can happen in both of them, right? So it is interesting. Uh, there are examples that we come back to why, where's the resistance coming from? And you touch on this as well. You, you didn't use the, you know, the term necessarily, but um, the the interest, the you know, uh, the, the the people who are benefiting from this, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could say they've come through that modern <coughs> system. They're sort of trying to allow the modernist system to continue as long as possible. Basically, that's a huge barrier to change, and uh, the alternates um, tend to be, like you say, radical mm -hmm. uh, leftists, etc., uh, who are trying to be anti-capitalists or, or anti-government. Um, you know, uh, so anyway, um, somebody else want from some comments? Yeah. <laughs> you still have a whole life. Right? You don't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you reflect uh, this kind of, of activism uh, to nature? Uh, natural societies, animal societies. Do you reflect these things? How how the lions? Oh, they will think about the lions. Will think about it's not that good. It's, it's just one guy who is the main. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, um, I, I I I find anthropocentrism. So looking at the things and nature from out of the human individual point of view not a problematic thing. We have no other choice. I mean, we are the humans, we have, uh, um, we have some power in our hands. Uh, we can destroy nature if we want, we can protect it, we can adapt to it. Um, but um, I wrote an article, um, a critical text on the position of the United Nations on harmony with nature. They have a text, harmony with nature. But it's a, it's a false harmony they present. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's not harmony with nature as like we seeing ourselves also as a natural being. Mm -hmm. It's um, finding a, a balance between the three pillars of sustainability, um, economic, social and environmental, and nature is the backdrop. 
And it doesn't work like that, of course, because you can, I mean, if you see sustainability, sustainability in that sense, it, it's still a perverse way of looking at things. Uh, it will not necessarily say, for instance, how to deal with our responsibilities to the next generations. Uh, loss of biodiversity. Uh, if there are, uh, say, 30,000 different species of coral reefs, and we manage to limit the extinction to 10,000 of them, are we doing something good then? You know what? It's, it's still calculation. And, uh, and I remember for the uh, World Summit on Sustainable Development uh, of 2012 in Rio de Janeiro, uh, we were with a group of um, activists um, writing treaties as, as uh, pamphlets for the politicians, uh, sustainability. And I had um, uh, I was respons responsible for the draft of the uh, Treaty on um, Sustainability and Human Rights. And I wrote a draft and I sent that to, I think, a collection of almost a thousand email addresses of activists all around the world. I mean, these networks existed already. And um, then I suddenly realized I had to do, I had to. Um, merge ex two extreme visions on human rights and nature uh, in that sense. There's the people who said human rights are economic rights. We really have to make sure that everybody can have a chance to play into the system. Uh, that's a neoliberal thing, of course, but it was connected to human rights. Mm -hmm. The other extreme said we cannot speak about human rights if we also not talk about the rights of nature, mm -hmm. the rights of a tree and the rights of a stone. Yeah. And of course, yeah. that was a problem. I mean, I, mean I, I don't find the vision that stones have rights a problem as such, mm -hmm. but to really combine those two, mm -hmm. to conciliate them. And then I made, I, I made a proposal every philosopher would kill me for, but that was the way up. I said, guys, let's only talk about entities who yeah, we cannot only assign rights, but also responsibilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a stone has no responsibilities. An animal, even the highest inte intellectual animals, uh, pigs or, or chimpanzees, have no responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We are the only creature that has responsibilities. No. Yeah. I don't so. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. But then, but it, I managed to really respect, and, and of course I want to hear your answer, I, I, I managed to really hold, keep respect for the people with the rights of nature, visions, the extreme visions, and also conciliate them with the, with the economics people. And the rights and responsibilities, for me, are intertwined. Our society is obsessed with balancing rights versus responsibilities. For me, uh, the idea of giving people the right to be responsible is something that transcends this. If you give someone the rights to be the right to be responsible, it can mean a lot of things. Mm. Uh, for a collective problem, it can mean the right to cooperate and co-decide. But it can also mean for yourself you have the right to destroy yourself as a human being. If you wanna if you wanna be a, a chain smoker or drink yourself to death, alcohol, then you can do that. Mm. Yeah? But of course there's, there's limitations. People have the right to be informed and we have to really protect the vulnerable and so on. So the, the right to be responsible is for me the, the route to go also talking about nature. Um, I was just wondering about the responsibility of animals. Animals have responsibilities. If, if they're in a herd, if, if you talk of chimpanzee or if you, if you talk of orangutans, they all have a high social competence, maybe a completely different, but they take care of each other and they fight against the common enemy, all that eat something, mm -hmm. all this, uh, I think, is a social interaction. But are we there? Yeah. If you have a lion, if you have a wolf, there are certain leading animals who take responsibility for, for their animals. I, I get it totally. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, we are um, applying a human concept to I, animals. I, I get your point too. Yeah. Since yeah. We, last year, SP Dana knows that uh, we had a, funny enough, in Brazil, uh, uh, a friend, Rafael Freitas, he, and he was talking of the perspective of Amazonian culture. I'm, I'm sure yeah. that Dana can explain better than I do, but 
The basic point was that a tree thinks of himself as a human, or the fish thinks of himself as a human. And so in order to make this picture round, we don't know whether they feel responsibility for us, or for other trees. <laughs> well, we know that trees communicate with each other about something. I find a, a more interesting concept than responsibility, um, vulnerability. Vulnerability is a central value uh, when you speak about ethics. Uh, nature, even the strongest animals, like lions, or, are vulnerable from out of the point of view of and what we can do as humans. Their fate is in our hands. And yes. they are vulnerable. And, that is and vulnerability is, a, is a, uh, what is vulnerable is something we find important. We will always assign value to what is vulnerable. Our children are vulnerable. So, yes, a cat which shows uh, itself vulnerable to me, it's showing its love to me. It's trust. Mm -hmm. So all that <laughs> reflects a certain empathic, uh, basic uh, responsibility that I say. Do they know how Katinka got famous? Oh, oh yeah, of course we know. <laughs> 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 She no, thought she... her cat was unhappy, she killed it. <laughs> and then she made a handbag. <laughs> she made a handbag from the skin. Yeah. She was not ill. <laughs> she was ill, cat? No. Was her no, it was her cat. Yeah, yes. it's nice. Yeah. 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 But she told me that I was thinking the cat dead, and she was like... No, 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 she killed it in order to do that. Uh, yes, but, but the message is, is about vulnerability. She yeah. talks about with why we, we, we prioritize these pets because they make us feel better uh, when there's so much extinction and so many uh, things happening to animals and nature that people really are not valuing. That's there's a, there's apparently, I read an article in The Guardian about a new series on Netflix. I don't have Netflix, so I cannot see it, but uh, about crazy relationships between human beings and animals. Yes, oh, yeah. I know. Yeah, you know it. And there is this story about a woman who sleeps, sleeps with her chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then at one point, uh, this chimpanzee I mean, behaves normal, which you can call normal in that context, of course. But at one point, he suddenly attacked her friend, another woman in the house, and he has eaten half of her face away. This is animal have responsibility? No, I mean, in the Middle Ages they were killed. I mean, they were put on the... No, the animal uh, has a responsibility because it protects the one, the other one. Mm. That is, of course. Mm. Okay, you might say it feels something like a sense of responsibility to do that. You yes. may say that, but yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's yeah. healthy. No, no, well, just saying there was no... I mean, if I read the article well, there was no threatening situation. Yeah. It just ran It just yeah. happened to yeah. run Yeah, but, but yeah. this is... Yeah. You know, an so, animal has certain instincts, so if yeah. it takes that serious, but, but I mean, the instinct says this yeah. is going to happen, and it's fine. So I'd like to pick up on that responsibility issue uh, to, you know, highlight this theme of responsibility to future generations. Mm -hmm. I know you've written and talk, spoken about that as well, and that is um, absolutely, the, it's essential for anything we want to do to move forward, to accept this. And, and our institutions generally do not take responsibility to unborn generations, to future generations. Many societies have had that, you know, the so-called Native American seven generation, think about seven generations, you know, from now, mm -hmm. what will be the uh, uh, affecting what we do now on those people. It seems to be apocryphal that that doesn't really exist, but it's a beautiful thought. So, what do you, you have anything, any comment on that uh, responsibility to, to future generations and how we might revise or, or, or um, somehow um, reform? Well, very simple, a very simple thing. Um, we um, I mean, philosophers would say there is no reciprocity between us and the next generations. Right. Um, our actions can affect them, their actions cannot affect us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's of course the timeline. Right? Mm -hmm. um, 
but at the same time there is no moral reciprocity near. Um, uh, we are obliged to take our moral authority serious. We have moral authority over the next generations, whether we want it or not, not because we think we know it better, but we cannot reason with them. We cannot talk with them. So we, we are obliged to really think with our own morality. And, and um, so the simple conclusion is that we have to really uh, be vulnerable, modest from out of that position, do our best today, and explain the next generations why we thought this was the best we could do. That's all. Right. Yeah, this, um, and I brought this up in the past, and I read you know, a very good book by Roman Karasnik I sent to you called the, the Good Ancestor, and that was based on a comment by Jonas Salk, the famous physician who invented the polio vaccine, who uh, made it available for free to the public, put it in the public domain, did not make any money on it, and he said, because I, I will think it's important to be a good ancestor. So I think this leads to this, this thinking, uh, but it will require incredible reform in almost every institution we have. Uh, interestingly, you know, religions uh, often are some of the more long-term thinking institutions that we've developed and yeah. also thinking mm -hmm. of future in that way, expecting to exist eternally. Yep, but it was pure self-interest. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe one, one last thing. Uh, we had a, the first day, Bert and I had a very interesting discussion, I found it really interesting, about the role of art mm -hmm. in society and in politics. Mm -hmm. I think there there is also work to do uh, to really keep on developing or caring for art that is critical. Uh, looking at the ethical dimension of art, of course art is free to do what it wants. Right? There is no program that is imposed on art, political program, to do what needs to be done. But um, there's too much aesthetics and not enough ethics. And, um, and I really think that um, Art as a critical mirror, uh, emancipating people, also young people in that sense, uh, still has lots of potential. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about art that is made in political contexts like climate change, and most of, most of that art is actually bad art. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really superficial, it's trivial, right. and so and so. What is the where, where is the critical potential? The critical mirror, mm -hmm. and uh, and and again. There is no program that should be imposed on art, but it's lots of potential to really do something with it there. Yeah. And my question to you would be then, if you work with young people, uh, you think that is a valuable route to go, and if so, uh, how to do that? To, to propose or help them generate or learn about art as a critical mirror. Self-critical, self-reflexive critical. Self -critical I think critical. Yes, I mean, as, a, as a, you know, teacher myself, that's, I, that's what I center on with the students. Yeah. But it also means uh, looking at where they are and how, what they're capable of. Now, yeah. even if I'm thinking, of, it, the art, art should be here, you know, I'm just going to get them from here to there. But often focusing on that, you know, what is what does yeah. it say about human? Are you thinking about the human experience, or is it just about your, you know, what your sadness about, you know, break your breakup? Uh, so it, it definitely trying to get them to look at these things critically. But I'm finding, and I've been teaching for you know thirty something years, a lot of most, very, I'd say, very few of students who who I'm teaching really are prepared to do that have been given the tools in their prior education to be able to do that or even know why it could be important or valuable. Yeah. So then that means I'm doing this, you know, re helping revise their education, yeah. you know, uh, while I'm teaching them. It's I'm, 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 I served as um, guest advisor for four years at the Rex Academy in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I was really happy to ask me because it's one of the best art schools in Europe. Um, uh, every year they get between 2,000 and 3,000 applications and they choose 20 people mm -hmm. from all.